Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chama, Head of Investor Relations and Communication at CEC PLC. I wish to welcome all of you to the call today, which will discuss the first half year 2015 earnings for CEC PLC. Thank you so much for joining in. Please do note that the presentation has been sent by email, but it is also available for viewing on the website. You can submit your questions using the link provided when you registered for the call. We will also take oral questions at the end of the presentation during the question and answer session. Our interim results were published recently and are available on our website for reference. Please feel free to contact me regarding any issues after the call. My contact details are available on the website. I wish to bring to your attention the usual disclaimer related to forward-looking information, which is published in our presentation. I now wish to introduce you to Owen Silavwe, Managing Director at CEC PLC, and Mutale Mukoka, the Chief Financial Officer, who will take the presentation today. The podcast of this presentation will be published on our website, which is www.cecinvestor.com as soon as possible after the call, as will be the transcript. If you have not registered on our website to receive notifications, please do so. The audio of the previous call is also available on our website. A reminder that you are welcome to submit questions during the call. A link does appear on our website landing page, and we will do our best to address them. But if we do not get the chance today, then we hope to provide summary responses through our website subsequently. I now hand you over to Owen. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'll start my presentation with slide uh, seven. And what you see there is something that you're obviously familiar with. There has been um, uh, one change during the first half of this year, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Obviously, under the CEC PLC, we've got CEC Africa, which is... uh, 100% 100% owned by CCPLC. Uh, and as you know, CEC Africa is our investment platform across the sub saharan Africa, where we have invested uh, at the moment in Nigeria, where through CAN uh, we own 60% in ADC. ADC is, uh, as you know, uh, the distribution company uh, in Nigeria where we have invested. And then we've got through CEC Hydro, uh, 20% in uh, North-South Power, which has uh, a concession to operate uh, a 600-megawatt hydropower plant in Nigeria. Coming back uh, to Zambia, we own 50% in CEC Liquid. Uh, CEC Liquid focuses on uh, the telecoms uh, industry in Zambia, where it provides uh, wholesale uh, bandwidth. The restructuring that I referred to earlier is where we've got uh, what used to be called uh, real-time. That company has been restructured in terms of ownership. It's now owned 100% by CC Liquid, and we've since changed uh, its name from real-time to High. And High will be focusing on uh, mostly uh, the the retail uh, customers, but it will continue to provide... Uh, the internet services uh, to some corporate customers as well. Uh, with that said, I'll move on to slide slide number nine. Uh, slide number nine, I begin to look at uh, the African power sector. As you know, some of you might be aware, if you look across sub-Saharan Africa, the problems in this power sector seem to be quite common. The, the, the region is basically facing a chronic electric supply shortage. If you look at the region, this is a region with an installed capacity of around 68 uh, gigawatts. It's inter- interesting that two-thirds of this is actually based in South Africa, which amounts to about 43 gigawatts, which means the rest of the region, despite... Um, the huge discrepancy, if you look at South Africa, there's only 50 million people, whereas the rest of sub, Sub-Saharan Africa has got 
800 million uh, people. So that obviously is a bit of a paradox. Uh, and it actually tells you a story in terms of the need uh, for capacity improvements in the rest of, of the region. Uh, you look at the growth, there is considerable growth averaging around 6.7%, and that growth at the moment is unmatched with the growth in, uh, uh, in generation capacity. And it's estimated today that to try and match this growth, the generation capacity itself needs to be growing at about 10%. So there are a lot of opportunities in terms of uh, the requirements in new, new generation capacity, and it's important that uh, the governments obviously create enabling environments uh, to enable the private sector participate uh, in this huge infrastructure requirement, together, of course, with the public sector. I move on to slide number 10. In slide number 10, we we'll obviously just try and uh, expand uh, on uh, the issues and the opportunities that we see in the sector. And as I said, we have seen over the last few years that the power situation has obviously been getting worse. The power deficit has swept across most of the countries um, in, the, in, the, in sub saharan Africa. And this has not spared even South Africa, where I think ordinarily the people would have expected that things would be different. Most of the markets in this region are currently affected by massive uh, power cuts. Uh, what is causing this, of course, is the underinvestments in new capacity that is required. Uh, we've got fuel shortages in some of the regions. And more importantly, in terms of trying to stimulate investment, I think there's a belief that the region or most of the markets in the region actually require governments to undertake reforms. But those reforms have not been forthcoming. If you look at markets like Nigeria, where gas plays quite a big role, this is the same with East Africa as well. There's obviously a fear that uh, the declining oil prices are going to have an impact in terms of stimulating investment in those regions. In terms of forecast, again, I've alluded to this issue. What we see is that over the next 10 years, the picture is obviously blighted by all these challenges that I've mentioned, including electricity shortages and the investments in new capacity, which then obviously leads to poor electricity supply overall. And this obviously has got a huge impact on the country's realization of uh, their economic dreams. However, you see that governments, governments obviously are beginning to do quite a bit uh, in trying to encourage investments and to ensure that uh, the power shortages that we've seen today that are impacting the, the economic growth begin to be addressed. We hope the governments do a lot more in this area to try and uh, encourage private sector investments. What are the likely concerns uh, in the market? If you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, again, the issues remain. We've got limited, limited capacity in terms of uh, generation. You look at uh, the generation per capita, that is low as well. And uh, this, as I said, leads to poor quality of supply and generally electrification rates are quite low. The tariffs are obviously a big concern, and I think with the sort of uh, power deficits that we are seeing, we hope this is an issue that uh, all the governments will, being, will begin to address. Uh, we are aware that at some of uh, the ministerial meetings in the last couple of months, these solutions have been made to ensure, for example, that the SADC achieves cost-reflective tariffs each of the countries in the SADC region is expected to achieve cost-reflective tariffs by the year uh, 2019. So it's every, everybody's hope 
that the government will push through with those uh, objectives. With that, I move again to slide number 11. Slide number 11, I try to focus a little bit on the Zambian market. And I start by looking at uh, the mining sector, which is the sector that we focus on in Zambia. Um, today, if you look at the mining sector in Zambia, the future obviously continues to look quite good uh, from the point of view of uh, the resources and also the investment that has gone uh, in this sector. Most of our big customers have been investing. They have actually in invested a lot of money in extending mine life and improving the economics uh, of, these, of these mines. We therefore expect that performance should be generally good. However, there are obviously concerns in terms of the copper price, which has been falling uh, for the good part of this year and is probably at its lowest uh, in, the last, in the last two years. This is uh, a cyclic phenomena, and if we look at the forecast, uh, we obviously expect that in the medium term, uh, the copper price will continue to be weak, uh, with expectations that we should begin to see improvements in the next one and a half, uh, two years or so. Um, on the demand side, the demand by our mining customers has remained strong as the picture that you are looking at on slide 11 shows you the Zambian mines are taking well over 50% of the demand, followed by the domestic customers, and then you've got the others, which basically includes other industries and the commercial customers. In terms of our forecast, we have expectations in terms of demand growth, which is in the order of 150 megawatts in the next two to three years. And what we are obviously showing here is uh, the demand that we believe uh, in terms of uh, uh, certainty, the level of certainty that this demand will materialize uh, is, uh, is quite high. Looking at the current issues, and opportunities in the, in the market. Uh, the big issues for Zambia include the low water levels that the country is experiencing at its power station reservoirs. And this obviously has resulted in the power deficit, the much talked about power deficit in Zambia, uh, which is having a huge impact on customers uh, in this country. As you may have heard, in the first half of this year, our mining customers were obviously not affected in terms of the power cutbacks. However, moving forward, uh, there is need for all customers to contribute uh, to the load management initiatives that are being implemented to allow the country to ride through this low water challenge. So what is it that we can expect? We expect within the next one to two weeks, that we'll be asking our customers to begin cutting back. However, what we intend to do is uh, we've gone around the region and tried to mop up any available power imports. So we are hoping to replace that demand which our customers will be cutting back with these imports as well as some of the generation that will come from the emergency, uh, emergency plants. Uh, one thing to note is obviously that this power will come at higher tariffs than the tariffs that our customers are paying at the moment. This is a discussion that we've had with our customers, and uh, most of them are willing to pay for this power so that they don't get impacted by cutting back their demand and therefore affecting their productivity. In the medium to long term, there are solutions that are anticipated, and these include the coal plants, in particular of Got Mamba, who are working on uh, around 600 megawatts of, of coal. We anticipate by end of quarter one next year, 300 megawatts should basically be brought on stream, 
and that I think should help to a large extent to alleviate the current challenges. The other options that are being looked at include uh, the grid scale solar PV. Uh, as some of you may be aware, the government has recently been making a number of pronouncements in trying to entice investors uh, in uh, grid-connected solar PV. That's an area that at CEC we are, we are looking at as well. We are currently busy uh, looking at uh, 20 megawatt solar PV on the copper belt. And once the, the feasibility studies that are going on are concluded and we get to an understanding of uh, uh, what are the requirements to develop this project, uh, we hope that we will be moving forward with that project. There are other options that include the HFO plant. Again, that includes some of the things that we are looking at as CEC. Let me move on to talk about the Nigerian market uh, to slide number 12. If you look at the Nigerian market, there have been some uh, uh, positive developments. Um, on 1st February 2015, the transition electricity market uh, was declared. And uh, what you also note is the Nigerian bulk electricity trader has delayed the activation of some of the power purchase agreements, of course, citing the failure of some of the distribution entities to activate uh, vesting contra contracts. What is the negative impact of this? What this actually implies is that uh, the indexation of tariffs that was anticipated to be happening has not taken effect. Some of the other good uh, stuff that has happened in the industry is that uh, if you look at the first half of this year, AEDC was always exposed to a penalty of $9.6 million. This arises uh, due to AEDC overdrawing in terms of its allocation uh, from uh, uh, the national generation port. So the rules then were such that if you overdrew on your allocation, then you had to pay a penalty. This has since been changed, and what's happening now is that the discos are being encouraged to actually draw more power. So that has a positive impact on both the top line as well as the bottom line for AEDC, and we think this is quite positive for the business. In terms of the tariffs, there has been a general tariff increase in Nigeria. However, there's still a lot of work to be done in that area. Specifically, we saw a 27 increase on the commercial and industrial tariffs, whereas uh, on the, the rest of uh, the customers, the discos have been asked to submit 10-year tariff migration parts that will be considered by the regulator. In terms of outlook, again, there is some positive news there because what we see is that um, an increase in generation is expected on account of improved management of the gas supplies and also investment in transmission infrastructure is beginning to materialize, which then means we should see more power being evacuated to where it's, it is required. Furthermore, we have seen uh, the liquidity position begin to improve uh, in the sector, which we think, again, is a good thing. And also, uh, judging by some of the things that are happening, uh, we see that there is some political will from the new government in Nigeria to try and do uh, things right and we believe that is good for, it's good for business. So we think the outlook is generally good for the business in Nigeria. And uh, at this point, I hand over to Mtale, our CFO, who's going to take us through the financial performance. Good afternoon. Uh, as introduced, my name is Mtale Mukuka, CFO of CCPLC. Uh, I'll take you through the financial highlights uh, of the half-year results for the group. 
Uh, we start with uh, slide 14. On slide 14, we provide you with uh, a consolidated statement of income, which essentially highlights the fact that uh, the business is growing. The half-year results uh, do provide a growth in uh, gross profit from 15% uh, last year based on the full-year audited financial statements to 29% based on the half-year results. Uh, from an earnings uh, perspective, uh, we have uh, a loss of $66 million for the half-year compared to $149 million based on the audited financial statements for 2014. Now, what are the drivers uh, for the revenue? The increase in revenue is essentially uh, coming from AEDC. AEDC has seen operational improvements stemming from uh, the billing efficiency improvements, which increase the energy or the value of our invoices. One of the things that happened at group level uh, was that uh, effective 1 January 2015, the group changed its policy on bad debt provisions. Essentially, we are now more aggressive in providing for debt, and as a result, this has increased the absolute amount of provision that we made, mostly stemming from AEDC, and for the half-year results, we have recognized almost $40 million uh, in bad debt provisions. I'll take you through the respective uh, financial segmentation of the operating subsidiaries in the group. To start with, we can focus on slide 15. We look at the PLC uh, results. This is the entity operating in Zambia. What we see in the Zambian operation is an increase in revenue, uh, an increase in revenue driven by the increase in power trading or uh, power trading flows. Essentially, CEC has got three business models. The mainstay of the group is uh, power sales to the mines, uh, buying power from the generators, mostly Zesco, and selling this power to the mines on the copper belt. The second revenue stream or business model is wheeling of power. So we will power for and on behalf of the state utility Zesco to supply the domestic and commercial users or consumers on the copper belt. And the last business model is a power trading model where we buy power in the region and sell this power mostly to the mines in the Katanga region through Snell, the state utility in the DRC. Now, what we see in the half-year result is essentially a shift in the business model for CEC with a bit more focus on the regional power trading, and we see, of course, an increase. If you see there, 267% year-on-year uh, flow on power trading revenue. However, I must state here that uh, even on the power sales, which is uh, the mainstay of the business, we saw an increase in the uptake, what the mines are taking. From an energy perspective, we essentially have a 2.1% increase. In gross margin, the group is definitely growing, and uh, what we see is an increase in gross margin to 34% from 30%. From that perspective, we actually see that uh, this business remains one of the few profitable businesses uh, in the group. Let's turn to slide 16, which provides the financial summary of a subsidiary called CEC Liquid. CEC Liquid is an infrastructure telecoms provider in Zambia. During the period to June 2015, there was a group reorganization in the CEC group, which essentially resulted in real time now called high telecommunications, being owned 100% by CEC Liquid. The results of CEC Liquid, therefore, have consolidated the real-time results. Turnover for the consolidated telecoms group 
grew to $10 million for the half-year results compared to $13.3 million for the full year 2014 audited financial statements. In terms of the key ratios, we see an increase in gross margin from 54.7% to over 64%. EBITDA has also increased from 12.8% to over 21%. The reason for the increase is stemming from the fact that the business is now covering its fixed costs. Prior to 2015, the business made a lot of investments in infrastructure. The focus for 2015 and beyond is to grow the business at the back of the investments that were made in 2013 and 2014. This business provides the required diversity in that it's the only business that exposes the group to the telecom's cash flows. Slide 17. This provides the income statement for the two operating subsidiaries in Nigeria. AEDC is the biggest subsidiary to the CEC group. AEDC's revenue uh, for the half-year results stood at $155 million. The increase in revenue is backed by the improvements in billing efficiency that we saw at AEDC. Despite the billing efficiencies having improved during the period, what we see as a resultant financial revenue in AEDC does not correspond to the increase in billing efficiency due to the fact that the Naira depreciated during the same period. As Elia mentioned when we talked about the group results, the change in the bad debt provision policy at group level resulted in an increased bad debt provision at AEDC. As a result, we have incorporated a provision of $40 million in the EBITDA loss of $53 million. If we see the results for AEDC, you actually see that there is an increase in gross margin, whereas the 2014 audited financial numbers provided for a break-even in gross margin, you actually see an increase in gross margin uh, resulting in $37 million for the half-year results. At NSP level, which is uh, the company that operates the 600 megawatt Shiroro Hydro, this was negatively impacted by the low water levels. As a result, the revenue dropped from $63 million based on the audited financial statements to $18.6 million. In terms of margins, we see a reduction in gross margin from 71% to 64%. EBITDA margin reduced as well from 65% to 33%. Slide 18 provides us with a summary of the key parameters that provide a long-term value proposition of the group. The key measures being provided there is essentially the revenue, which show a growing revenue from 2001 to from under $150 million to half-year results for 2015 in excess of 250. The dividend payout, from 2009, we had a dividend payout ratio of over 80%, which reduced in 2011 to 2014 at the back of the investments that the group was making to secure future cash flows. We anticipate that going forward as a mature utility, we should provide the right balance between dividend payout and investments in subsidiaries. Having looked at the financial numbers, we now want to focus 
on some of the operational statistics, specifically on AEDC, the entity that contributes the losses to the CEC group. The key main parameters that we use to measure the performance, operational performance of AEDC hinge on the losses split between collection, billing, and commercial losses. What we see is an improvement in billing efficiency month on month from under 60% in January 2014 to over 80% in June 2017. From a collection perspective, we see a slight increase in collection efficiency. What you actually see is that as the billing efficiency improves, the ability for the business to collect the additional energy that is being billed is also slowly improving. In as much as this is not improving at the same rate, on average, we actually see a steady collection efficiency of around 70%. In absolute terms, we actually see an absolute increase in the cash collected by this business. Overall, if we summarize the billing, collection, and technical losses, we actually aggregate that into what we call the aggregate technical commercial and collection losses, which is shown on slide 20, the top graphs. You can see the top right graph provides an average improvement in losses, starting with 56% in January 2014, ending up with 43% in 2015, June. Having looked at the operating statistics for AEDC, the distribution company, we can now turn to slide 21, which provides the key statistics for North-South Power, the company that has a concession to operate the 600 megawatt Shiroro Hydro. From a generation perspective, uh, comparing January to June 2015 with January to June 2014, we actually see a drop in energy generated month on month, with the West month coming in in May when the generation dropped close to zero on account of the low water levels. From a collection perspective, we actually see an improvement in cash collections uh, between January 2015, January to June 2015, and January 2014 to June 2014. In percentage terms, we're comparing 87%, which is the collection efficiency in 2015, compared to 57% the same period. Having discussed the financial results with some color on operational performance for the group, we now turn to slide 23, which looks to identify the business focus for the operating subsidiaries in the group, also looking at the key drivers that will drive the business, and finally ending up with uh, the focus activities for the last half of 2015. From a Zambian perspective, we expect increased flow from a power trading perspective, and therefore we think that this revenue could essentially become permanent and sustained revenues. However, we are mindful of the fact that there are short-term power generation shortages in the country, and therefore we'll continue to explore and seek to source power in the region to meet our customers' requirements. From an economic perspective, the depreciating quarter would definitely impact on the business. We must be noted that uh, all our key contracts at CCPLC level are in dollars, and therefore 
we do not expect the depreciating quarter to negatively impact on the business. The main drivers for the last half of the year for the group will essentially be underpinned by the expansion projects coming from the mining. Specifically, we look at the NFC mine, new expansion projects, the Synclonium project being done by Glencoe Mining, as well as the KCM, KDMP expansion projects, all of which are expected to increase energy inflows to be supplied by CEC. In the medium term, we expect to target the Katanga province mines, which should be supplied with power sourced from the region. We expect flows to increase in and out of the DRC upon completion or commissioning of the second interconnector, which is under construction. We anticipate that this should be commissioned within quarter three or early quarter four. We continue to improve the performance of AEDC. We just highlighted the billing, technical, and collection efficiencies, improvements that we've shown to date. And we think that at the rate we are going, we'll see more and more improvements in that area and achieving the AEDC plan as previously envisaged. From a telecoms perspective, the focus now is to acquire more revenues at the back of the new infrastructure that has been laid in Lusaka, the new products that are now being sold, which are new in town. We also expect that from a Nigerian perspective, the investments that the government or the gas supply company has made in the pipelines as well as in the transmission lines supported by the World Bank should allow for more flows of energy to be evacuated to the distribution companies which can then sell this power. The commissioning of the turbine three at Chiroro Hydro will also increase availability of the plant and allow the generating plant to generate more energy as we go through the rainy season. Based on today's forecast, the meteorologists in Nigeria have indicated that Nigeria is likely to have no more rainfall this year. Therefore, finally, the focus for 2015, uh, the last half of 2015, will essentially be to continue to implement the turnaround strategies at AEDC, to focus our energies in Zambia to completing the projects that will support our customer expansions, particularly at Mopani, a Glencoe-owned mine, as well as uh, the NFC mine. We anticipate and expect to commission the second interconnector RRC. And finally, we expect to focus our energies on sourcing power in the region to meet our customer needs. This ends the formal presentation. I now hand back to the moderator for a Q&A session. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take questions first from the web. In the meantime, if you'd like to ask a question from the telephone conference, please press star then one to be in the queue for questions from the telephone audience. I will now hand over to Chama to take questions from the web. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ari. The first question I will read out, and um, somebody wants to know, why is the investment in the media and Sierra Leone project not included in the group structure? Thank you. Uh, this is Mkale. I'll, I'll take that question. Uh, the group structure that has been uh, provided in the slide is limited to operating subsidiaries uh, currently under the CC group. Uh, we have not included uh, projects uh, contemplated 
uh, under the, the CEC group. Uh, what we have, for example, in Namibia is essentially a right to invest equity at financial close uh, at the time the project uh, will move into construction. So from that perspective, uh, the companies in Namibia, as well as Sierra Leone, are not yet operating, but we anticipate that once we reach financial close, which should be sometime at the back end of this year or sometime early next year, then these companies will form part of the CEC group. Thank you. The next question is essentially in four parts. Um, how do you see the power shortages in Zambia? How much impact will it have on your margin? Are you considering importing electricity? And when do you expect to start doing that? And what are the cost implications for this decision? All right. Um, this is Owen. Let me talk about uh, uh, the power challenges that we're having at the moment in, in Zambia. Um, the Zambian power shortages are a concern uh, for everybody, uh, utilities, customers, and the government as well. And uh, we've been working with all the parties to try and uh, find solutions to this. As we have said in the presentation, up to this stage, uh, our customers have not been asked to cut back uh, their demand. However, we've gotten to a point where we need everybody in the country to begin contributing to the efforts um, that are being made to try and ensure that the, the country rides through this challenging period until the next, uh, the next rainy season. So in the course of next week, um, we are likely to ask uh, the mining customers to begin contributing to the load management initiative. However, what we have done uh, before effecting those cutbacks is that we've held discussions with all the customers, we've gone out in the region, tried to mop around the power that we can find, and we'll begin making that power available, whatever power that you can get from, uh, uh, from regional sources. Um, we've discussed, obviously, the cost implications with our customers, and uh, uh, the customers are willing to pay for uh, this imported power which is going to come at a slightly higher tariff than the, the prevailing tariff. That obviously makes sense, given that uh, cutbacks are going to have impact on, uh, on their productivity. In the event that uh, the imports that are available from the region are inadequate, uh, we have been quite active looking at what are the other solutions, but those solutions are actually even more costly compared to uh, the imports. However, we'll continue having those discussions with our customers uh, so that uh, we mitigate the impact uh, in terms of their production, but also we mitigate the impact this could have on CC's cash flow as well. Thank you. Um, the next question reads, it appears that your Nigerian investments are still making losses. When do you expect to start breaking even? Thank you. Uh, this is Michele again. I'll take the question. Uh, for those who've been following the CEC story and uh, the acquisition uh, of AEDC and NSP, uh, you do recall that uh, the asset particularly AEDC had a five-year turnaround uh, strategy plan. Now, before year four, we did not anticipate that uh, the business is going to be profit-making. However, the expectations are that once the losses reduce uh, from the high levels, at the time we took over, the overall losses were in excess of 16%. Uh, which essentially means that uh, for every 100 megawatts that we are saving or uh, we are buying, we are essentially losing, uh, only collecting cash for 40 megawatts. Now, as of today, uh, we have transformed uh, the assets a little bit. Uh, for every 100 megawatts that we are buying, we are essentially uh, only losing 43% uh, of that, which is 43 megawatts, which is a great improvement considering that uh, we only bought this asset 
slightly over a year ago. Uh, the expectation is that uh, these improvements should continue, and uh, we anticipate that uh, within the next uh, 24 months to 36 months, we should ideally have a profitable business uh, that will uh, contribute profit to the overall group numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Kali. Um, the next question is also around Nigeria and the elites. Uh, how are the losses in AEDC being funded? Any recourse to the profitable Zambian operations if there is debt in AEDC? Thank you. I'll, I'll take that question as, uh, again, Susan uh, Kali. Uh, at the moment, uh, the CEC uh, entities are uh, essentially structured uh, on a project finance uh, framework. Uh, so essentially you have business units or entities within the group that are reinvent from most parameters, specifically from uh, cash perspective. So what you don't see are essentially leakages between uh, entities. So the Zambian entities cash flows are limited to Zambian uh, operations, and if at any one time there is need for CCPLC to inject additional capital or subsidize any operating subsidiary in, uh, within the CC group, at that point the expectation is that uh, both decisions will be taken and requirements for capitalization will essentially be made. From an operational perspective, there are no cash leakages between entities in the CEC group, and therefore, AEDC is not subsidized by CEC. From an operational perspective, I guess, uh, how is AEDC surviving? Uh, we did mention uh, at the last brief which situation has continued to prevail even up to now is that uh, AEDC is essentially using the payment to the market operator or NBET as the case might be, which is essentially the cost of power which comes from the generation unit to absorb the working capital shock that the business is experiencing. Uh, under the interim rules, which were the rules that uh, AEDC was operating on, up until probably February, the requirement was for AEDC to only partially cover the market operator's bill. Uh, at that point, the obligation was to cover 62% of the bill. Now, what that means is that the additional requirement, especially the 35% of the market operator's bill, is used as a working capital bridge for AEDC, which allows AEDC to then cover its operating costs and ensure that from a cash perspective, it's EBITDA positive. What proportion of your power supply will be through wheeling, and what is the revenue per megawatt from imported power versus the whole CEC supply? What is the expected incremental, if so, in aggregate from imports from the SNCC. Um, thank you, Jimmy, for, for that question. Um, I take it when you talk about wheeling, uh, you are referring to international wheeling. Um, the level of international wheeling has obviously increased um, in the first half of, uh, uh, of this year. I've seen um, a considerable growth, and this is mostly driven by the power that CEC itself is selling uh, in the in the DRC. Uh, in terms of the import, as I mentioned, uh, the imports are a lot more expensive in comparison uh, to the power that uh, we buy from the Zambian sources. And uh, what we've done to ensure that uh, our customers are prepared to be discussing these issues uh, for the last two months or so with our customers to take them through this process. And I think what's important to note is that uh, 
uh, the power in the SACTs um, in terms of uh, price can actually change. This is different from uh, the long-term contracts that we've got in country that we are used to, uh, to having both ourselves and our customers. So we expect that uh, these tariffs uh, will be changing from, uh, from time to time. So I can't at this point uh, give you the actual revenue you expect from import, but I can uh, probably give you some information in terms of uh, what level of import we expect. In terms of cash flow, the expectation is that uh, the next week we'll be asking customers to cut back by a maximum of 30%. Now, customers have the two options. Uh, they could cover part of that through efficient improvement, and then the rest of it they will try to access um, people. Some of them, of course, their own diesel generators, they could decide uh, to use their own uh, uh, diesel uh, generators. Um, so that is, uh, this is the process that we've been, uh, we've been following. More importantly for CEP, what we'll try and do is to try and cover uh, the internal CEC tariffs uh, when we bring in, uh, we bring in this power. Whether we can cover the internal CEC tariff or the margin, if you want to call it that, then we'll try and make sure we cover that. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. The next question, um, are you going to raise debt or equities for CEC Africa? Are you considering the right issue? Thank you, Chairman. I'll uh, take that question. Uh, yes. Uh, from a group perspective, uh, there are plans to raise uh, equity uh, at CEC Africa. Uh, the equity uh, to be raised at CEC Africa will essentially be funds that will be used to support the projects that uh, are currently being developed, which projects we expect should reach financial close sometime early next year. Uh, at the moment, there are no plans for a right issue at the uh, CEC uh, PLC level, but uh, should that position change or should the board deem it necessary, we'll definitely come back to the market with a uh, firm response. Thank you, Kari. The next question, how much of the $40 million of bad debt provision is abnormal due to the change in policy. Thank you, Shama. That's uh, an interesting question. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure abnormal is the right way, uh, <laughs> but uh, essentially, maybe I can just talk about uh, the two policies uh, that we had, the policy we had before and the policy uh, we adopted uh, in January. The policy we had today, uh, sorry, last year, was a policy that essentially assess respective uh, customers uh, based on the, their ability to actually pay the debt. So you look at uh, what is provided from a contractual perspective that uh, this debt will not be recovered. So if you look at ADC, it does supply different types of customers. Some of these customers are essentially government and quasi government institutions. Others are commercial utilities. And then you're also talking about residential utilities. Now, under the transaction document uh, with AEDC, the regulator uh, essentially assists in collecting debt from government and quasi government institutions, which essentially means that uh, from an accounting perspective, it's highly probable that we're not going to write off any quasi government or government debt at the back of the. Thank you so much. Sorry we, we lost you there. Uh, I'll probably just cover the question again uh, on that day. I was just saying that uh, the change in budget provision essentially is a change that amends the policy as opposed to looking at the credit. Uh, position of the data to essentially looking at uh, a time period on when, how long that date has been overdue. And uh, if you look at that, you essentially uh, writing off any debt that is overdue 
by a certain number of deaths, irrespective of who the data is. Uh, I hope that uh, this covers the question. I'm not too sure where we lost you, but uh, I hope uh, I provided an adequate answer to that. Thank you, Tali. The next question is, um, when can we expect a decision on whether a final dividend will be paid? Thank you. Thanks for that question, uh, Chairman. Uh, I think as we know, uh, payment of a dividend is obviously a matter that is uh, to be decided by the board on the basis of the performance of, uh, of the company. Uh, given what's happening in the, in the market with the power shortages uh, in Zambia, uh, the board will obviously uh, want to ensure that uh, uh, the company uh, performs uh, well during this period for them to be able to make, uh, make that decision. I'm sure they will be quite happy to, to approve uh, a final dividend if the company uh, performs uh, well during, uh, during this period. But I think suffice to say that this really is dependent on the performance of the company and if the board is satisfied that the company has performed well enough to be able to make a final dividend uh, payment, then obviously that, that uh, will be communicated uh, to all investors. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. We'll move on to our last uh, email question. And, um, when do you expect the Kudu and Sierra Leone project to become operational? Are they on track? Uh, thank you so much, Shama. Uh, I'll take those two questions. Uh, starting with uh, the Kudu project. Uh, Kudu project is uh, a priority project in Namibia. The Namibian government has uh, allocated substantial sums of money to facilitate the development uh, of this project. Now, all being equal, uh, the expectation is that uh, within the course of next year, 2016, this project should reach financial flows and uh, construction at that point should commence. If financial flows is reached in 2016, the expectation is that uh, this project should be commissioned in 2019. So far, indications are that the project is on track, uh, but we'll continue to monitor uh, the progress and we'll continue to communicate uh, to our stakeholders. Moving on to Sierra Leone, uh, the Sierra Leone project was negatively impacted by the situation which uh, I think we all understand that uh, there was a medical or an Ebola uh, situation in, uh, in Sierra Leone. Uh, current focus are that uh, this project should close within the course of uh, next year. And from a planning perspective, the project has got a construction period of around 18 to 20 months. So we expect that after 20 months from financial close, this project should become operational. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I will now hand over to Ari for the live question. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star then one. To ask a question, please press star then one. We have a question from Paul Robinson of Lorium Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, afternoon everybody. Thank you for the call. Uh, just Two questions, um, just on your bad, your bad debt provisions. Um, I mean, is it likely that you will eventually recover and reverse these bad debts to the government and quasi-government entities? Uh, and if so, I mean, what, what type of time frame are you expecting, or do you think that they're gone forever? And then secondly, what would you expect your power sales in Zambia to be for the second half? Okay, thank, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, this is Mitali. Uh I'll cover the first question, and um, I believe Owen will take the the second question uh, on budget provision. Just to clarify the provision, uh, I hope I, I haven't insinuated that uh, the forty million dollars relates to ourselves to government. 
and quasi government institutions. Uh, that was just an example. However, having said that, uh, I must also state that uh, yes, there are also some outstanding overdue amounts to some government and quasi government institutions. And uh, at the moment, our estimate is that uh, we will continue to, to collect this. Uh, this amount on an ongoing basis, we do not anticipate that uh, there will be a time period when we'll collect uh, everything at once, but uh, this being a business, we think that uh, collections will be aligned to uh, business operations and this will be ongoing. So our expectation is that uh, we should see an increase in collection efficiency uh, once these funds are collected and uh, we we'll also see some form of uh, budget right back uh, when this happens. Now, because uh, this is an ongoing uh, situation, what we'll actually be seeing is that uh, embedded in the budget right off, there will also be right back. And therefore, the next position at that point will depend on whether the right off are higher than the right back at that time. Uh, Owen will cover the, the second uh, part of the question. Oh, sorry, I maybe just have a follow-up on the first half of the question there. Are you still providing power to any customers who, who do have these bad debts, who are in this 40 million bad debt number, or have you cut anybody off? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the current uh, policy that we, we employ, we, we try by all means to Maybe I can just uh, explain from an operational perspective. Operationally, we have uh, prepaid and postpaid customers. Now, what this means is that uh, for prepaid customers, we do not accrue uh, any liabilities with them. They actually, uh, we actually end up owing them some money at the end of each month. For metered customers, uh, these are customers who we invoice. Uh, at the end of the month, and the expectation is that uh, within stipulated periods, they should facilitate payment. Now, if a date remains unpaid and that date is not disputed, then at that point, our expectation is that uh, any unpaid date beyond a certain time frame, we should retreat the customer. So we essentially cut off the customer as a first call. Now, Restriction of a customer depends on the type of customer uh, you are restricting. If, for example, it's uh, a hospital or some other strategic institution, the expectation is that uh, because we are operating in an environment, uh, we expect to engage the stakeholders, uh, being reasonable and recognizing the strategic uh, nature of uh, the institution that we are supplying, we push for them to facilitate and make payment. Now, sometimes it's just uh, a cash flow issue from a timing perspective in that uh, they do not cover the full view at the time we want it covered uh, based on our books. But we see uh, them lagging behind in terms of payment. In other instances, yes, there are overdue amounts which remain unpaid. And under such scenarios, we have taken extreme measures where we actually end up restricting, including strategic uh, institutions uh, in the case of uh, the Nigerian operations. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, this is all. I just to talk briefly about uh, uh, any expectations uh, in terms of uh, reductions in the power bill. As I said, um, obviously, if we don't do anything, uh, by providing either imports or power from uh, immediate sources, uh, then we take a hit by about 50% on ourselves. Now, that obviously is significant, and we can't allow that to happen. Uh, that's why in my presentation I said we've made efforts on our part to ensure that we bring in uh, uh, imports uh, to cover that demand that cannot be made by sources from uh, from Zambia. Uh, so we are working very hard to ensure that we cover the full test percent and uh, uh, we try to ensure that there is no reduction in terms of our sales. However, for periods where we can't 
uh, file input from the region. Uh, it is likely that uh, uh, we can have uh, a small reduction um, in our in our cells. So we are we are basically working on the basis that we keep the overall reduction in our cells as small as possible, uh, probably around five percent. But anything else above that, we'll try and cover that through uh, through imports and, and other sources. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me just to add, just to add to that, uh, in terms of, uh, I think if you look at the core side of the business, given the situation that we're facing, what we try to do as well is to try and manage our costs during this period, uh, and therefore for things where we think we can postpone the expenditures, we will do that until the situation has improved. Thank you. Robinson, are your questions finished, sir? Yes, I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a final reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star then 1. Our next question is from Chama Kamukwamba. Please go ahead. Hello, everybody. My name is Chama. Um, my question is, will, will um, CEC PLC manage to maintain its uh, margins should ZESCO uh, go ahead and increase its tariffs as recently permitted by the Roman government? Thank you, um, Shama, for, for, that, uh, for that question. Um, as a matter of principle, uh, as you know, in any business, the customer is going to pay the bill. So if there is any increment in tariffs, the expectation is that that full increment have to be passed as the customers. I uh, will use that principle in the instruments that we've had in the past, and it's the principle that uh, we believe uh, the energy regulator uh, is basically following, and therefore we expect any instrument going forward, uh, we, we basically have a system where those instruments should be passed uh, to the end users. And uh, what the government has announced the last few weeks was basically a policy announcement which would then require the regulator to follow some process uh, to effect any increment that they will come up with. So that process will include the consultation of CEC, ZESCO, and the customers, and it's obviously going to ensure that those increments are passed to the customers. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no further questions at this time. Mrs. Labwe, um, Mr. Mokaka, and uh, Chama, would you like to make apologies? Mr. Robinson has come in for a follow-up question. We can go to Mr. Robinson's question. Yeah, hi, gentlemen. Sorry, while well, I've got you on the line. Um, can you maybe just give a bit more information about where your power imports would come from, um, which countries, and, yeah, I, I guess just how, how available this air power is in the region. Okay, thanks for that question. Also, um, as I said, what what we've basically uh, done is that uh, we haven't really focused, as you know, in the region. What we have at the moment is almost uh, all the countries, with the expectation of uh, Mozambique, have caused uh, shortages at the moment, and uh, these shortages are occurring at different times. So what we have tried to do is uh, to look at how it was power during what time. And therefore, the power that will be getting is coming from different uh, markets within the region. Thank you. Okay. Um, and, I mean, given this constraint, the whole region is having serious power shortage, uh, it, do you really think you'll only be able to maybe have a reduction of only 5% in your power sales, given what's happening in Zambia? Yeah. Well, if, if, if you look at the power situation, the key challenge in Zambia is not so much capacity. The challenge is energy, and what that problem does, it doesn't restrict you in terms of when you can bring in your power. So we're taking advantage of uh, some of the aspects of the challenge that we've got, referring on that to structure um, import contracts that allow us to bring in energy at times when our potential suppliers can make that energy available. So using that principle, we think we should be able to cover as much as possible uh, 
with respect to the, to the shortage that we've got. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen, we have a question from Cornelius Macari of Anibok. Please go ahead. Thanks for the call. Um, just one question from me. Uh, could you please uh, maybe try to clarify the definition of your billing uh, and your collecting losses? Um, and as a second question to that, to that, can you also explain AEDC? Um, what are the tariffs that you what, what are the tariffs you uh, at the moment in dollars per kilowatt hour? Uh, that you're, what are you paying and what are you selling at in, in, in Nigeria? Okay, no, uh, thank you so much, uh, Cornelius. So we'll, we'll try and provide you with uh, uh, any information which is not uh, market sensitive or confidential uh, on this call. Uh, from, uh, I think the first person, it covers uh, the billing and collection uh, efficiencies. How are these measured? Now, I'll go back to the example which uh, I gave earlier. If you buy 100 megawatts at a bus bar, uh, and this 100 megawatts ends up in our network in Nigeria, ultimately, the expectation is that the 100 megawatts will have to be transported through our infrastructure, which is our network. Some of the 100 megawatts will essentially be low uh, in the wire as technical losses, and uh, whatever remains as residue will essentially be supplied to the customers. Now, out of the supplies to the customers, we are going to build a portion of it, or uh, a certain portion will be built. Now, there are, there are the reasons why only a portion will be built. In certain instances, you've got customers who are not metered. Uh, they are on fixed, uh, fixed rate uh, per month, and the expectation is that uh, part of this reform, the target for AEDC is to ensure that uh, within a four, five year period, metering of all the customers is a key KPI. So to the extent that some customers are not metered and they are on fixed rate. It essentially means that uh, whereas from an invoicing perspective, you are invoicing them at a fixed rate of say uh, one megawatt, you might actually find that uh, in practical reality they might consume more or slightly less than what you are actually billing them. Now the second part of the differential between what they consume and what you are invoicing essentially falls into what is called the commercial losses uh, for the business. Now, at that point, when you measure what is built against uh, what you expected to build, essentially it gives you a ratio which we call the building efficiency. Now, out of what you build, not everyone uh, pays on time, and not everyone actually pays because you have a certain portion in budget uh, provision. Now, the collection efficiency essentially compares what you build uh, against what you actually collected. So from that perspective, those parameters essentially help to measure business efficiency at various levels, starting from the infrastructure, which is the technical losses, the systems that you are using to build, which is uh, the metering, as well as uh, the billing platform, which measures the billing and commercial losses. And then if you are aggressive in actually collecting the money, that measures the collection efficiency. I hope that clarifies the three uh, parameters. Now, from, from a tariff perspective, uh, at the moment, uh, what we see from a Nigerian perspective is that uh, the overall tariff is very different to different customer categories. Now, this is not unique to Nigeria. This is uh, applied in most countries uh, across the world. The expectation is that uh, for individuals 
or consumers who essentially just have uh, uh, a very small consumption rate, they are essentially on what is called a lifeline uh, tariff, which is uh, a very low tariff, uh, which allows them to probably just connect uh, one appliance, which might be a fridge, maybe it does not allow them to to cook uh, on a stove. The moment they go beyond a certain number of kilowatts per month, the expectation is that then that moves into a slightly higher tariff band. Now, because we have this blend, you actually realize that uh, there are very different tariffs for different uh, customer categories. However, having said that, the expectation is that uh, the average tariff uh, at which we, we invoice most customers will range between uh, 20 Naira per kilowatt to about 25 Naira per kilowatt. Thanks a lot. And hold on. And what uh, and what what do you buy the the, the power as an average? I mean, I want to understand the size of the gap. Thank you so much, uh, Cornelia. Unfortunately, I I will not give you the full information uh, because of the sensitivities around it. But I'll probably just give you the structure. Uh, okay. at, at the moment in Nigeria, uh, we have uh, different generation sources, and uh, different generation sources have different tariffs. So, for example, if you are buying from uh, a gas plant, each gas plant, depending on how far it is from the grid and uh, where it's buying its gas supply, they will have very different tariffs. The same applies to hydro. Hydro will also come in with extremely different uh, tariffs uh, at which they supply the grid. Uh, if you look at coal as well for coal-generated plants, they also have a very different uh, tariff because the cost profile of all these generation sources is very different. However, for respective discourse, the expectation is that uh, you're going to get a blend tariff. Uh, now, in the rain season, when the water levels are high, the expectation is that uh, the contribution of hydro to the sort of package of uh, energy supplies to a respective disco will essentially be higher. And therefore, the weighting uh, of the hydro tariff uh, is a see-through, which you essentially see as a disco uh, in your cost profile. However, if you go into the dry season, you actually see that uh, from a Nigerian perspective, there is uh, a lot more reliance on uh, gas supply generators and therefore the weighting from a tariff perspective will essentially be leaning more on the prices at which the gas suppliers, uh, the generators, supply to the grid. Uh, I think that provides you the framework. I will not uh, go into the details of uh, the respective tariffs uh, as supplied by the respective generators, but that should give you uh, a framework on the, on the pricing structure. All right. Thank you very much. Back to the management at CEC for closing comments, please. Um, I think at this point, I just want to thank everyone for coming through, joining us on this uh, on this call, and uh, for all the the participation. I think when I look at the last two calls that we've had, this has been uh, the most lively, and I think this is uh, this is quite encouraging. I hope that we've given you all the information uh, that you need. However, if we haven't managed to answer any of the questions today, we are quite happy to answer those questions through email and also through um, most of the platforms through which we get to interact uh, with, with you guys. I mean, if you're in Zambia also, our offices are open. Feel free to come through. We can come and discuss uh, some of those issues. Otherwise, thank you very much, and it's goodbye from us. That's from CSP Management. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's call. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines.